few, but always a bit difficult to be the last person presenting. So I think hopefully I'm going to cover quite a few things that we've covered over the course of um, these, this kind of um, seminar. Well, essentially what I want to talk about today is an exhibition we've got at the moment in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Cambridge. Um, it's on for about, well it's on for a year and a bit, um, it opened about two months ago. And it's looking at the Mesolithic site of Star Car, so we're kind of repeating things what Dawn was talking about earlier. Um, and the title of the exhibition is a survival story, prehistoric um, settlement, Star, Star Car, prehistoric settlement. So I'll talk about why we chose the uh, title survival story later, but it still makes me feel, because we're in two months after the exhibition, I still feel like I'm surviving it. Um, <laughs> the, our museum itself um, is quite small, and there's only three floors if you haven't been there. Um, we have a downstairs at temporary exhibition area, which is where this exhibition is. We get about 70,000 visitors a year, um, and it's kind of kind of broad audience. So we get uh, lots of tourists, students, and then interested locals as well. Um, um, but what we have is about one million artifacts and a very small museum. So we're only able to display about 0.5% of our artifacts in the display area. So that's another reason why we've got the temporary display area, so we can um, keep things going. So, just an instruction if you don't know about the site. So, it's a Mesolithic site, um, 11,500 years ago. Um, Starkar was a, a site on the edge of a lake, um, a Paleo Lake, which was called Lake Flix, and wasn't called that then, but um, we call that. It's long since dried up, but as you can see, it's kind of a different world from that map from the one we occupy now. Um, but the connection to Cambridge, why are we doing an exhibition on a Yorkshire site in Cambridge? Um, it's a university museum. Um, and one of our missions is to talk about research and new research. Um, and we're really fortunate in the fact that um, Professor Graham Clark, who was a um, lecturer at the, in the Department of Archaeology at the museum, um, conducted the excavations there in the late 40s, early 50s. So the material from this site is split between about five different museums, um, but we've got probably most of it, I would say. Um, so that, that's, what, that's what's there. And generally when you put an exhibition on, you don't know exactly what's going to be in the exhibition. Like putting up an object list is one of the most difficult things. But for this one, it was really easy. It's pretty much as much as we possibly could get out of Star Car material that we've got. Um, so why is this site special? Um, so in addition, this comes back to my title, um, in addition to the stone material that you usually get from Mesolithic sites, we have really well preserved organics from this site. So we can get a different perspective on life in the Mesolithic from what you normally get. It adds more detail, it gives us more information about life. Um, and we also have a series of these, I've called them mysterious, that's what cropped up this morning, isn't it? <laughs> Trying to hook people in. These headdresses, and um, whatever you want to call them, what's called frontlets, made from deer skulls, um, and they've been modified as well. Um, so the antlers have been lightened. And you can see the holes at the front. We don't know whether they're eye holes or whether they're used for securing costume. It could be for both. Um, but what made this exhibition actually a lot easier for us is that there's been a recent research project ongoing for a long period of time. Um, people from the University of York, Manchester, um, and Chester. And they've extended on Clark's finds and actually um, really um, transformed our understanding of the site. So we were able to include that kind of information as well. Um, so they found more frontlets, you can see one there. Um, you see that in the corner, that's a decorated pendant, so um, some very early decoration. But coming to the reason for the presentation, really, um, although this is an amazing site and there's fantastic information about it, the actual artifacts themselves, like that one there, are quite small and brown. So our challenge when we were thinking about this, we wanted to show this site off, but actually, how do we get the audience to stop and look at something? How do we engage them? What's that hook that we can get them in there? So what I'm going to talk about briefly is, I basically think I've pulled, tried to pull everything out of the museum curator's toolkit and whacked it into this exhibition. And whether it's worked or not, I'm not sure, but I, I found it particularly challenging. It wasn't challenging in the way that trying to choose objects, which is what I've usually found with exhibitions, um, it's actually, how do we get people to stop and try and tell stories and get people to listen to our stories? Um, and the things we wanted to focus on are the story of the site, but as the name, the title, Survival Story, in, it indicates, it's the actual survival of this stuff. Actually getting people to realise it's 11,500 years ago. That's a long time. Um, and the other thing, we did a kind of small focus group, and people didn't realise that they were people like us. They assumed that 
they weren't necessarily people like us. So it's trying to get that, communicate that as well within this. Um, and those were specific challenges we, we, we had to tackle. So, sorry, I hate diagrams of exhibition areas. This is our exhibition area. Um, does anyone can go point? Um, so, it's about 100 square meters. That's the entrance, that's the exit. So, the story starts with an introductory case, but then we wanted to talk about um, making a living. Because Starcar has this extra information, how people made objects, how they how they um, lived. Um, and also they found things like the first house there, various other things in Britain. Um, and then we wanted to move on to the environment. So move, one of the issues with Starcar now, because it was an old lake that's dried up, with land drainage, actually the archaeological material is under threat. So that fits in with wider university concerns about the environment and other political concerns. So that comes back to, that's where our thing was, that's what we wanted to think about, changes in the environment and linking it with the past. And then the end section um, tries to hook onto this mysterious aspect about what these um, headdresses were, trying to think about people's beliefs. Um, but the way I'll show you a few images in a minute, but the way we kind of tackled it was that there have been these different ideas of what these headdresses were. These are other objects, because we're an anthropological museum as well, where other cultures use similar things, and then that lead into that, that way to kind of create discussion. So, um, what are the tricks? So this is a display of, do you see this, the one that I showed you, the small things, they're bar points made out of antler. Um, and we've got 93% of all the known bar points from Mesolithic Europe, or is that right? Yeah, um, in our museum. So why the hell not put them all on display? So that's what we did. Um, but it's on that principle where you've got a small thing, but if you've got lots of small things, then it creates an impact. Um, similarly, we had to think about different object types. So, in the environment section, um, I'll talk about how we try to create the environment a bit more in, in a minute, but we've got loans from the Natural History Museum, from the Sedgwick Museum. So our museum is part of eight other university museums within Cambridge, so we're lucky we can draw on that kind of thing. Um, and trying to create stories about animals that aren't there anymore, like the aurochs, but also animals that are. So can you see, this is my son's favourite, the hedgehog, because um, it was found on the side. But um, trying to create different narratives about the environment. And then using the ethnographic analogy, so we're fortunate in one of the interpretations of the headdresses is that it's a shaman's headdress or some kind of religious practitioner. We've got a beautiful shaman's costume from um, Manchuria that we've put on display, and that's actually the first time we put that on display for a long time. So there was an opportunity to do that as well. Um, keep your eye on that piece there. We also commissioned various bits of artwork, so I haven't got another picture of that, but other kind of ways of thinking about things, so artistic interventions as well. Um, careful design. Actually, when I first saw this paddle, so that's, believe me, that's meant to be a paddle. When I first saw that, I thought, how on earth am I going to even make that make any sense? So, putting pictures up, there's a similar picture to one that you displayed earlier that you're using in the Yorkshire Museum, I think. Trying to mix things up and, and trying to actually stop and make people look, stop and look. Similarly, how do you arrange a load of um, microlips in a kind of pattern? It's like, I, I don't know where it quite works, it's a little bit gimmicky, but I know for a fact that the tranche axes on your uh, right, people are stopping and looking at that. It's like not just presenting one axe or um, other aspects. And then another other thing we try to do is trying to put people back. So um, one thing I should say is about our budget for this exhibition. So I previously worked on a British Museum exhibition on the Carrolls and I had a much higher budget. We only had £12,000. So when we're talking about getting illustrations, what we're looking at for illustrations to help us out to put people into this thing is artists' goodwill, really, to let us use their, use their material. We can't necessarily dictate what, they, what we have. Um, so what we do is we kind of, one in the background is, uh, is by Dominic Andrews. It's used, um, so it's used in a lot of different illustrations. We also use some material from a graphic novel by, it's called Mesut, um, by Alan Brockman. Um, and that's actually been surprisingly popular, I'll show you. But we kind of tried to mix things up so it wasn't just one type of representation. Um, another thing we were able to draw upon with the new research, so this is Ben Elliott, who's been looking at how we make a bar point. Um, and what we were able to do is we kind of made a kind of step-by-step -step guide of how you would do it, and that's how we presented it in the display. Um, but I think it, it shows kind of what we're trying to do is show the effort that was put into making something like this. It's not just there. Um, also, reinterpretations. So, this is made from um, a moose, um, elk, elk um, or, um, antler, 
and they've always been interpreted as being some kind of matic, but um, new kind of excavations might be, might be useful with working. I'm not sure how long it would last, but you know, it's kind of putting the new sort of things out there is actually engaged people and actually thinking, how could we maybe use that? Um, and the thing that's been pretty excruciating uh, for us is writing the text. So um, we're talking about before how you need to kind of limit what your texts are. So I started out with a limit of 120 words. I used the BM guidelines, and then 80 words. And if I 80 words for a labelled text. And if you if you start with that, I found it actually quite useful. Um, but we kind of tried to use a um, a different way of try, different sort of tense. So. 11,500 years ago, the climate was warming rapidly after the last ice age. You're trying to tell that story and set things up. Um, and we found that that kind of works better than a kind of passive, passive tense. Um, but it, it's quite hard to write in this style. And what we did is we had a kind of, there were a group of us. So I think only three of us worked on the set of issues. Um, and we kind of wrote it together. And I found that quite a useful um, perspective. And what we were thinking about while we were doing this was that it's not for me. Um, actually helped, I'm not an expert on the Mesolithic, but it's not for me, it's for people who are coming. Um, and what would they actually think? And we always try to turn it around and think about that. So each time we had a panel or a, um, or a label, we we're actually thinking, what story is this object telling? Why have we got that here? If we, haven't, if we if it can't tell a story, it doesn't fit into the narrative, drop it. And that was the kind of, that's the process that we went through all the way through. Um, I'm not sure I like the two last bits. Starcar gives us a snapshot of the Mesolithic with Dars. Life was different, but the people were just like us. They, we kind of just had those are the kind of two messages we wanted. And it didn't quite make sense to join together. So it kind of sits like a little island at the bottom. But at least if people read it, they kind of hopefully will get that kind of message. And we're trying to make people work. So Sarah Jane Hartner, our outreach officer, always says in a label, you need to make people work. And her, um, her thing is look, look again. So um, it was what we were talking about before earlier, where Sally was talking about it. You look at it, have a think about the objects, look at the label, then look back at the objects again. And we've actually, we're using all of the stuff that I teach the university students, how to write a label, I actually actually used it in, in practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we don't, haven't done an evaluation yet on this, but, I'm not, but people will actually have what I love is when you go in an exhibition after you've finished and you watch people in there, and people are actually looking and coming back to them. So it seems to be working. Um, this display is um, thinking about kind of making um, making clothing, um, and it, it it kind of looks a bit Flintstones. But we're trying to mix up different different ideas of how you might display something. Another thing we've benefited from is um, other research. So I mentioned that the material is in five different museums. So I think there are about 30 odd headdresses now um, that they found. So we had 3D prints of quite a few of them. So we wanted to show the variety. So we've got probably two of the sort of most best known iconic ones on display, but um, we want to show those big ones, small ones. So when you're thinking about people, um, it isn't just necessarily that picture we had of a man wearing one. There's a roe deer one, which is tiny. So if other people are wearing them, could that be a child or uh, someone else? So we're trying to actually make that point within that, with that, within that area as well. Um, it's what we had, we had ideas that we would 3D print these and then people could wear them in the exhibition. Um, that's not gonna work because they cost so much to reprint and we're worried and they're very fragile. But um, what we're gonna have is um, we've got volunteer explainers trained up within the, um, within the exhibition and people will get the opportunity to handle various things as well. So, and that kind of information. So we will have that kind of interactive element in there. Um, they're being trained as I said, well, not today, but they were yesterday. Um, the other thing about the technology is we kind of tried to create this kind of immersive experience. This is Goosegate, sorry. So a day before we opened the exhibition, Marcus Abbott, who put this together, said, oh my God, I've got the wrong species of goose. <laughs> So, <laughs> so you, had to, you had to redesign it. So we've got the video which kind of, this, this fantastic um, recreation of the environment made by Marcus. We also have um, a recreation of what the sounds of the Star Car Lake environment might have sounded like. So moose, various things, people flint lapping, so that's in there as well. And we've got smells as well. So on one of the benches where you can sit here, 
you can smell the swampy environment. They did, they did have in the thing that you can buy, um, they did have um, a rotting deer and what they smell like, but I decided that we wouldn't have that. So, um, so the idea is that kind of sound, kind of immersive uh, idea that you're talking about to the environment section. Um, it kind of, it's actually really cool. He's got this pipe swinging through here and I don't know how much time we left, but yeah, you see he's coming through and then there's a front bit in there. So what it also tells you about is some idea of how that material is preserved as well. So that was one of the ideas um, in there. So, one minute, that's perfect. Um, thinking about how it's been received. So I mentioned it's only been open two months um, and we haven't had a chance to do evaluation yet. But um, as far as you can tell from social media, no one's moaned about it yet. People in the, people in the um, going through the exhibitions are very positive. Um, but some of the things they've picked up on in social media have actually been really helpful because they were things that we were aiming for. So I'm hoping that means that it's been successful. So this bit here, which says about the sensory um, evocation of at Star Car, um, PT smoke fire, that's one of the other smells. Um, actually, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. We've got reconstructions of things happening. So we've got Professor Nikki Milner, who is a project leader for this. She's creating a fire. It's not a bloke doing it, it's her doing it. So we've tried to do that kind of thing as well. Um, and this one is my favourite. This appeared on the Prehistoric Society Facebook page yesterday, so I thought I'd put that in there. And it says, well, it says, the creator has put many of the objects into context in an interesting and diverse way. For example, a step-by-step -step guide to creating barbed points, a film of Mickey McNamara making fire from flint and pyrite, lovely artworks and a soundscape with depictions of typical wildlife setting landscape, and the shaman in different societies. So really worth a visit. Um, that whole thing actually describes what we were trying to do. I couldn't have paid him to write better thing, but um, <laughs> but I'm hoping that he's not the only person who's taken that away from the exhibition. So thanks very much.